That's actually a pretty good intro for the next talk because people are moving now. They're not sitting and typing. They're moving like body action. It's excellent. Good, good, good. Okay. So, so it is a great pleasure for me being able to introduce you to the next speaker. Most of you actually, I guess, know him already. It's Nick Farr, Nick Farr from Washington, D.C. He is many, many things. He's creating hack labs. He's a pretty, he's a pretty nice guy, although he's an accountant. Uh, but he is also talking about stuff like cloud banking and other interesting uh, new dimensions of uh, the financial system that could be started in the next months and years. But today uh, he will speak about dancing as a form of like revolutionary uprising, I would say, or maybe? In disguise. In disguise. Okay, so a big applause from Nick Farr and direct action through dance. All right, thank you, Johannes, um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, this is uh, an idea that I've been, that I've had for a while, pretty much since the uh, Republican uh, National Convention protests in New York. Um, I've been thinking about ways of uh, sort of communicating the message through demonstrations and direct actions in ways that would reach through to people uh, like my parents. Uh, my parents tend, are on the conservative end of the spectrum. They're more right-wing um, people. Uh, and at the time, it seemed like they didn't really understand why people were so upset. You know, at the time, they bought the whole party line about the Iraq war being about fighting terrorism. And they were unwilling to look at, um, you know, why people in New York were so upset, why they were protesting um, the RNC. And I was, it, I, I even sitting there watching news coverage, of these protests with my parents, I couldn't effectively communicate um, the message that the people who were demonstrating were trying to communicate to them. Eventually, of course, they got it. You know, we all realized what was really going on that came out in the course of the presidential election. But it's a shame that when people demonstrate, um, a lot of times that message is co-opted by media, and that um, the thing, the, the messages that are being communicated out in the street among the people who are in the street, when going through the media filters and then when going through all of these varying different levels and layers, it gets diluted, manipulated, twisted, co-opted, and then what ends up coming out on the other end of the radio, on the other end of the television, in rural areas of the country, where most Americans live, um, where my parents happen to be and where I happen to be studying for my master's degree at the time, by the time the message gets there, it's something completely different than what was communicated on the street. And I was thinking, you know, how can we sort of fix this problem? Uh, that it, it, at least as I see it, how can we make it so that when we go out and we demonstrate, um, the message that we're trying to communicate actually gets through to the people who are on the other end of the television screens and the radios and the mass media filters. Um, but just before, just a couple of intros, disclaimers. Um, one thing that hasn't really been mentioned uh, at this conference, at least I haven't seen it yet, is the feedback system uh, in Pentabarf. Just to take a step back real quick. Um, if you go to the, uh, the SIGINT website and the pages where, you know, they have the schedule and all these uh, talk descriptions, there's a feedback link right here. And that uh, providing feedback on all of the talks that you've seen here at the conference helps the organizers um, do a much better job of gauging which talks are popular and which themes are popular. And that's especially important um, for the first year of a conference like this. So I encourage everybody to, when they have a little bit of time or if they're on their laptops right now, to go to the SIGINT website and give feedback on all the talks that they've seen, good, positive or negative. Um, it also helps the speakers that in the submission that we use, or in the system that we use to submit our talks, um, there's a little portion there that says, you know, what we did well, what we could improve on. So it both helps the speaker and the conference if you go back and leave that feedback. So I encourage all of you to do that and encourage your friends to go back into the system and leave that feedback. Um, just so that you know, my website, uh, which I recently updated, is nickfar.org, N-I-C-K-F-A-R-R.org. Um, my Twitter is also Nick Farr, but with a uh, four instead of an A um, at the end there. The hashtag for just thinking about this concept that I'm just going to throw out there um, is direct action dance. Um, I know this seems a little bit odd, but I'm not a dancer. I'm not a choreographer. I did jazz dance um, when I was in grade school and high school went through college, drank a lot, forgot everything about that. Um, the, the most that I'll do today is be listening to my iPhone in the, um, 
Washington metro system and just get carried away by the music and start dancing, get approached by a metro police officers and told to, you know, cut it out a little bit. Um, I, I love motion, I love dance, but in no way am I an expert on actual physical movement or creating physical movements. The, the most that I'll do is arrange little last minute dances of guys dressed in suits for weird things that Johannes has me do at Congresses. That's, that's about it. Um, but one thing that I do think is important to point out is that I do have a good deal of exposure with law enforcement and with law enforcement tactics. And I think that as we consider new strategies for um, street protest and using dance and using alternative forms of communication in the process of demonstrating that it's very important to try to keep in mind the tactics that law enforcement uses to do their job, the, law, the tactics that media use um, to go about doing their work and you know, either intentionally or unintentionally manipulating the message, and to really think consciously about that. That when you're organizing demonstrations, when you're organizing political movements, you have to keep all of these varying different um, attack vectors in mind. You know, it's as hostile an environment as the network security environment. But a lot of times people who are organizing, people who are politically idealistic, tend to forget, um, you know, that there are very practical organizations that are coming in and looking at these different things. And when they are thinking about it, they think about it in more paranoid ways. You know, people are not actively trying to infiltrate all these movements. People are not actively, you know, monitoring all of your different activities and things like that. A lot of the way these messages get corrupted and a lot of these movements get corrupted um, are through, you know, less obvious ways than you'd think. And so it's just important to keep that in mind. And of course, the last thing is, is that this talk and the whole idea and the genesis behind this talk is um, sort of an application <laughs> that I'm throwing out there to Johannes because I would like to develop this idea further and work with the people um, in the Museum's Quartier in Vienna to try to you know, actually work with dancers and choreographers and bring what I know about police tactics and media manipulation and varying different things like that to try to do and create something both with art and with politics through this. So this is, this is all for you, Johannes. Okay, I'll send you a fax. <laughs> All right. Okay, so just to begin, why is it that we demonstrate? Um, when I'm framing why people actually go marching out in the street, I think it's primarily for two reasons. The first one, the most obvious one, is people are upset with the state of affairs, and they want to communicate their dissatisfaction with that state of affairs. They want to redress their grievances. Obvious. That's why people... You know, that's why you would think people go out in the street. But the second more important point, I think, that occasionally gets lost is that when you're out in the street demonstrating, um, you know, against a war, against political policies, against pending legislation, against a lot of these different things, if you're at a point where you have to go out in the street and demonstrate, odds are you're somehow politically disenfranchised. And in the course of your daily life, you may feel very alone. It's very hard to feel a sense of solidarity for your beliefs that you're going out and demonstrating for. And actually being out in the street, being out in a plaza, being with other people who feel the same way that you do about a particular political issue is something that's very reaffirming. It's very easy to lose hope when you're a single individual out there facing the system or feeling like you're alone. And going out there and demonstrating with people and feeling that sense of solidarity is an incredibly powerful feeling and is a really good reason to demonstrate, even if the message is completely lost, even if nobody sees your demonstration, nobody recorded that it happened, the fact that you're there with people who believe the same way that you do, actually going out there and doing something is powerful. And the whole thesis behind this idea is that using dance, you can enhance both messages. You can enhance both reasons why you demonstrate. One, you can feel better. You can feel more in solidarity with people. You can actually physically feel the nature of your politics through dance, and at the same time using dance and proper techniques, you can more effectively communicate the message that you're trying to communicate through demonstrating. Um, just to sort of frame what I'm talking about here, when you see this image, just, just ponder it just for a quick second and look at it. Completely devoid of context. You have no idea why these people are here, why there's tear gas in the street, what's going on here. <coughs> what's, what sorts of words, what are the first like two or three words that come to mind when you see an image like this? Fun. Okay, <laughs> Yo Johannes thinks fun. Spicy. Right? Spicy, okay. Well, who, I heard something over here. Riot? Riot, okay. Riot huh? Black 
Okay. All right. Rodney, what, what do you think of when you see this image? Police. Law. War. Violence. That's, the, that's That, I think, is the critical thing that comes out of this message. Well, no, but, but you said violence. You don't think that, but is this, is this, do you, you don't think that this image is an inherently violent image or one that communicates at least some form of violence? The fact that, you know, people are covering their faces. You know, people are running. There's tear gas in the street. There are obviously police involved. This is a very compelling image. Journalists who do television, journalists who do photojournalism, journalists who are engaged in somehow communicating images, or even radio in sound, they look for compelling images. They look for images that are powerful. They look for images that are going to get people to stop clicking through on the TV, stop and wait there for them to communicate what happened so that right after this image is over, they can go sell ads. That is what media is essentially looking for. It's not anything, it's not like they're trying to manipulate your message. It's not like they're out there trying to co-opt your movement into selling ads. No, they're looking for compelling narratives. They're looking for compelling images. And unfortunately, violence is a compelling image. That something like this, that this particular protest, this may have been one extremely small, isolated incident by a group of people who intentionally wanted to agitate, who intentionally wanted to force the riot police to use and implement tear gas um, in the course of protest. It could have been you know, any number of different things. Months of organizing, you know, months of coordinating people could have been lost in a moment to a couple of people who are providing media with a compelling image that's violence. Immediately, whatever political message the people who are demonstrating was lost. Um, people who are in the position that my parents were, sitting in the Midwest, you know, sitting in a small village somewhere, all they see is, oh, okay, a bunch of young people are being young people, and they're going out and they're protesting because that's what young people do, and they have absolutely no thought of questioning whatever political order or questioning whatever policy or questioning anything that was going on in the course of that demonstration, that that was lost. Because media is looking for compelling images. And that, that's something very important to keep in mind, just in, in any activity, that the media is not out to get you. They're not out to forward any particular political agenda. At least I don't believe they are. They're out to get a good story. They're out to get a good picture. And unfortunately, violence creates good pictures. Here's another image, starting with this side of the room. After reflecting on it for a moment, what does this image convey to you? Happiness. Entertaining. Entertaining. Like They're hmm? running towards something. They're running towards something. Fun. Patriotism. Patriotism. A completely different set of reactions to what's essentially the same thing. You know, this, is a dem this, this came out of a demonstration advocating freedom of speech in New York City. The people who put it together were very conscious about creating powerful images, about connecting with an inherent sense of nationalism that people who tend to be right of center have instinctually, the kind of things that you know, my parents would react to. You know, here we see bright, vibrant colors that evoke the imagery and the symbolism of the American flag. You, know, you see peop young people who are excited about something. That's one thing that old right-wingers really like to see. They like to see young people excited and happy about something. You know, it reminds them of you know, the sort of uh, angelic, uh, utopic thing that, about their youth that never really existed. You know, that, Creating images like these, and that if you're looking to try to communicate a political message, or you're trying to communicate something, you're trying to communicate advocacy of a policy, you know, it's important to keep in mind who your audience is. If you're, you know, if you're the CCC preaching to the CCC, obviously people are going to be incredibly receptive to your message. And even if they don't agree with you, they're at least going to understand your points and understand where you're coming from that the battle is something that is already won or lost when you're dealing with your core constituents. When you're going out into the street, when you feel very strongly about something, about challenging the political order, your audience 
is, your audience and the people out there are the people who don't understand you the people who are more prone to just completely write you off. You have to go out, create compelling images, and grab their attention somehow. Just by looking at this, people who tend to be right of center want to think, well, you know, what's that all about? You know, why, why are, what, what are these images? What's being created here? You know, they instinctively want and are curious to find out more as opposed to the image of violence, which they've already written off as, anybody know whose cell phone that is? Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> I, I, I can wait. It's cool. He killed the bird. He killed the bird. Daddy D, real quick. I have a question about the photo. Was this taken by a photographer or by one of the organizers? It was taken by one of the organizers. Photographers. Right. It was taken by one of the organizers, photographers. Yeah, this, I, all of the, all, yeah. And how many of the actually used it? How many, how many newspapers or whatever actually ran with that photo rather than with their I actually don't know how many news organizations ran with this photo. Um, but this photo was licensed. And that's another important thing. All of the images that I use in all of my presentations are um, licensed for non-commercial use um, under the Creative Commons Act. And it's very important, especially when you're dealing with media, to make very clear that if you want the media to use your image, that it's licensed in a way that commercial organizations can use it. And throwing it out there, they will, you know, if they see something that's Creative Commons, good for commercial use, they will pick it up and they will run with it. That media is, just like any other organization, they're looking for the most efficient way of approaching something. And if you're creating compelling narratives like this, you know, if you're already handing them good work that advocates your point, it makes absolute sense to make sure that they know that they're okay to use it, even though you're sending it out to them. Make sure the licensing and everything like that is clear. But that, no, that's a very good point. Because I know our media, we will, yeah. if it's Creative Commons, we'll be really good. Here's, it's, stand up and introduce yourself real quick and, and say that point a little bit more loudly. Um, my name's Dave Dempsey. I work for Team 4F. And Creative Commons is one of those things that can, we'd like to be able to use it, but we will tend to be a little skittish about actually using something, especially Right. So the very important point here is when you're licensing with the Creative Commons, if you want media to pick it up, make sure that you don't label your work for non-commercial use only. So, all right, moving right along. Um, obviously, you know, those last two images were about communicating your message through the mass media. Um, but just discounting that, even if you are not a choreographer, you know, even if you're an organizer or you're active in a political group, just creating some form of movement, some form of simple dance, even if it's just stretching before a meeting, or even if it's during a very intense meeting where people are getting very angry with each other, just taking a quick break, you know, letting the smokers go outside and puff their cancer sticks, and then just leading everybody through some form of physical stretching or exercise, um, or getting people to hug each other, or getting people to just you know, do some kind of crazy dance and reward them for being that guy that's doing that motion. Creating physical experiences is something that, at least in the United States, we've lost a sense of. And being able to create those kinds of experiences do build a kind of camaraderie and do build a kind of understanding that it's very hard to build through standard rhetorical, symbolic language and experiences. Um, aside from that, if you do have access to choreographers, if you do have access to people who are very well acquainted with physical movement, and with dance, that creating opportunities to say practice some kind of a dance for a demo, or get people who aren't very well acquainted with dance to learn salsa, you know, to learn jazz dancing, to learn all of these various different things, and getting people to move creates a much better environment for the kind of informal interactions between people that build movements. You know, even if you strongly believe in something and are with a bunch of other people who strongly believe in something, just being in that political kind of an environment creates a lot of opportunities for people to become antagonistic with each other. And that when you're crafting these sorts of political ideas, it's very important to look for ways to get people to work together and to get along with each other and to build friendships that aren't based purely in politics. And I think we have two comments, one from Johannes and then, oh, oh go ahead. I was going to say that. Stand up so they can, actually, why don't you just come up here and use the microphone so everybody can hear you. Yeah, come on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's for the recording. Uh, yes. um, uh, uh, la, 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 la. Hold on, he's 
the sound guys to turn the. I hear yet. Yeah. All right. Good point. <laughs> okay. Hi, Nick. Hey, hey. That's so um, one of the uh, one of the really great uh, groups of folks that comes out of the protest <laughs> movement, of course, is Improv Everywhere. Uh, yeah, now, improv. yeah, mm -hmm. Improv Everywhere, and they uh, they do lots of amazing choreography. So if you want to feel inspired by uh, by people, you know, even though they just do flash mobs commercially, it comes out of this entire movement of folks in uh, New York City pulling off these amazing. Mass actions. Say that name real quickly again. Improv everywhere, and you can go to improveverywhere.org. Awesome, sweet. Cool. And then now, now Johann, it's Johannes's turn. Yes. G give him a round of applause for having no, to no, stay no. close okay. to me throughout all okay. of that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, Nick, <laughs> Daddy. Uh, <laughs> he, he's doing this just so he can do this. Yes. That, that, that's um, <laughs> first of all, Improv Everywhere, they will be coming to Vienna in September to the Paraflows festivals, just in case someone wants to see them. And the second thought was, isn't it almost like co-opting this idea of like the parade? Like you see like dancing people and people like having like carts and cars and fun and blah, blah, blah. So like 4th of July parade, stuff like that. Isn't it like a possible idea? Yeah, no, that's exactly it. It's co-opting. And uh, one of the things to bear in mind, especially when you're considering left of center so sorts of movements like this, is co-opting the imagery of the right. Because when you're looking at how you know, the right wing was able to do and create the kind of political um, you know, that, that manufacturing consent, they co-opted a lot of the left's most popular imagery and a lot of the left's most popular rhetoric and discounted and sort of turned, you know, the word liberal into something that was dirty in the United States and did a lot of that kind of very careful image manipulation. We saw this during the Reagan administration. Um, Casper Weinberger was an excellent, excellent um, media manipulator and crafter of, um, and creator of consent. And then, of course, Karl Rove during the Bush administration was also a political master at this. You know, that the, these were, and these geniuses really come out of the right, know exactly what they're doing, and are able to get all of their little minions in lockstep and forward out that message. And it's also like steamrolling. It's like a blitzkrieg over the media, the way that they're able to do this. And this is unfortunately something that left of center movements, which people, I believe, are more prone to be trusting of and prone to be sympathetic towards. I think that a lot of times left of, the left of center has not done nearly as good of a job as at creating you know, these people who are very good at imagery and very good at creating hope. Of course, the obvious exception to this was the Obama administration and that their use of imagery and that their use of iconography, their use of um, a sort of new kind of rhetoric. While they had a very fertile breeding ground um, you know, in the aftermath of the Bush administration to do this, that that's the first kind of, um, I think, sign that we've seen a more leftist center movement creating this sort of pan-media kind of message. And it's something that you have to think about when you're creating, when you're, um, you know, looking at your own political movements back at home. Um, you had one quick... Yeah, come on, come on. Back up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure they will organize a... a, a standard microphone at, at some point, but yeah. Okay. Well, uh, one of the things uh, to keep in mind about the, about, the Obama, uh, about the Obama Hope campaign is it was actually crafted by a guy named Yossi Sergent. Now, Yossi is a track bike riding, non-car owning Los Angeles citizen, vegan as well, um, who comes out of uh, our, our movement. And, uh, and his whole thing as well was making use of positive messaging and bringing in iconography like Shepard Ferry and all these other all these other things, and that was one of the things that uh, made this the campaign very successful to have very little content and lots of hope. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good no, but but that uh, that's a good point. Get, you should get a round of applause for that. Um, uh, I think we've already covered a lot of what I wanted to talk about with this slide, and just in terms of creating. Um, a compelling visual through dance, but I guess just to throw it back out of there, what, what are some sorts of things that um, you know that you like to see? What are some things in images? Just try to think of just the last sort of picture that you've seen of some kind of form of direct action 
in the media that automatically comes to mind when I throw that idea out there. And then think about what sorts of things um, about that image attract you to it. Does anybody have something that they, they think of or a story, some kind of image, visual? <laughs> that <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody else can think of something off the top of their head? Do we have a wireless microphone yet? One for the audience, one for questions? We're working on it, but we don't have one yet. Uh, oh, okay. Giving, giving everyone who wants to talk this time. <laughs> like hmm. A community time. Actually, I like that idea. <laughs> let, let me see if I can actually... See, this, this is physical performance theater right here. So I can, okay, so, all right, so when I'm, can, can you guys still hear me, or? Okay, let's, maybe I should move it. That's fine, I, I think that, that's, that's good. That's, that's the point. Are you on IM right now, because I can send you an image. Actually, the funny thing is, I am on instant message right now. And that's, uh, it's nickfar at gmail. Actually, this is incredibly nerdy. I'm wondering what people are thinking of my email right now. <laughs> my ex-fiance picked it out. I blame her. Oh, one person left. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, why don't you just email it to me and then I'll... Here, I'm sending it to you right now. Okay. <laughs> it's got to be good. This has got to be really good because people are waiting for it. So you should get an email from me right now. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. <laughs> It's it's coming. Wait wait for it. Uh, here, click okay. View. Okay. So this was from. What? No no no. Put on the tie. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Hi. Okay. There was a there was a KKK demonstration uh, yesterday, uh, and uh, like yes, there was a racist demonstration. Can you believe it in the states? Racism. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Um, so there was this demonstration, and uh, and all these uh, Nazis and KKK folks uh, showed up, and they kept on chanting, white power, white power. However, the clowns showed up each time, and they had uh, and they had all these signs that said, wife power, and they started, to, like all these women started lifting up all these guys, and you can see right over here. And, um, and then they, they were like yelling, no, white power, white power. And then they, uh, yeah. and then they changed the signs to say white powder. <laughs> and, and, and they started throwing flour in the air and s snorting it off of like mirrors and it was ridiculous. Yeah. Dude, that is, that is awesome. Give it up yeah. for his awesome improv skills. Cool. All right. Now, let me get... Uh, can you guys still... Hmm? Uh, I know Jack the first line. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, huh? Okay. Well, that's... The, uh, is that better? Do you have to bring it up a little bit more? Sound guys hate me. And I used to work in radio, so... Um, all right. Is this, can you guys still hear me now? Is this okay? Yeah. All right. I feel like I'm on a cell phone commercial. Um, but it's, in, <laughs> it's, it's important to take these tactical considerations into account. Um, one of the things that I think people, that hackers in general, there's an automatic distrust of anybody in authority. And that kind of distrust, when you, know, when you feel it as strongly as we feel it, we bring it to our interactions with people who are in authority, with police officers, with administrators, with um, basic bureaucrats. The thing to remember when you're dealing with anybody who works in government or anybody who has some kind of authoritarian position is that odds are most of the time people are not very nice to them because they're trying to get something out of them they don't know how to approach them. 
when you're dealing with anybody in authority, remember that they're a person too, that they have feelings, that they have a job to do, that for some reason they felt strongly enough about what they're doing to you know, proceed in their careers to the point where they're at that position where they're able you know, to you know, give you what you want or deny you what you want. So when you're, ever you're approaching police officers or whenever you're approaching civil authorities, whenever you're planning sorts of demonstrations and going about that process, remember that even though they may be completely on the opposite side of the point that you're trying to advocate, or they might be preventing you from doing what they want to do, or might be creating all of these hurdles, preventing you from achieving your ends, always remember that they're a person and that you have absolutely nothing to gain by approaching them immediately from the get-go with an antagonistic attitude that if you give them as much of the benefit of the doubt as you're able and approach them in a nice way, smile, you know, be nice to them, bring them a coffee, you know, ask them what kind of donuts they like or whatnot. You know, <laughs> cops do, and that's actually a very true stereotype, cops love donuts. Um, yeah. Huh? Don't, no, don't, don't bring. Don't, don't do the donut thing, period, in the States. Where, uh, da Daddy, Daddy's saying don't do the donut thing in the States. Where, where, where example, huh? Okay, it don't walk into a police station with donuts. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's very true. At a, at a, at a protest, in a protest situation, when you're standing there and they have their, their riot gear on, and you're at the front, and you know that you're... Come, come. It's me. Okay. Yep. The uh, the point is, if you're in a protest situation and and they're in front of you and there are a lot of people behind you and you're about, they have the clubs and yes, you don't say, "What kind of donuts would you like, <laughs> sir?" Because they will take that as a very um, dehumanizing insult because it's obvious that I think that you're a cliche. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a very good point. Yeah, give him a round of applause for dealing with the tie. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so that's, that's just, uh, even though that's a good point when you're dealing with cops, don't, don't give them the, uh, the excuse to be, Jens, do you want to come up and wear the tie? Okay, Jens has a point here. Okay. So, uh, this, this is pretty much my, my own personal opinion, so this is not like, Okay. the opinion of the CCC or anything. But uh, I agree with you on, on lots of the points that you have. Uh, and for instance, having a newspaper piece on uh, what, whatever, hundreds of geeks protested for uh, fr more freedom in the internet and then having this tear gas picture that you just showed would be a disaster, of course. But uh, just keep in mind, sometimes things are not that black and white, and sometimes uh, there are situations where you are not, although mostly you can uh, get over your message better if you don't go for the violent option, uh, sometimes you just don't have that option. That's, that's part of reality as well. Uh, I want to stress that. I mean, there are, you're right, police officers are people too, but on the other hand, it's, it, it is not a myth that there is a certain police unit in Berlin who is just pretty, you know, happy to, to uh, battle down uh, <coughs> protesters. So, yeah, there is this stuff as well, but right. then there are these kinds of demonstrations where maybe your goal is to, whatever, stop the eviction of a squad or stop uh, Nazis marching down, and then you are not looking for um, good uh, PR in the in the mainstream press, and then it's a whole different story. But yeah, that's I, that's just what I wanted to add. Okay. Cool. And that then that's that is a very valid point. Give give Jens a quick round of applause he, for all the work that he does. Ah, yeah. uh, my poor tie getting destroyed. Uh, just some other quick things because we're running a little bit out out of time. Um, whenever you're dealing with civil authorities, they love information. They love paperwork. They love as much information as you can provide to them. As much completely irrelevant documentation that you can provide to them, of course, you know, slipping in what they're actually looking for and saying, oh yeah, it's on page 65 or whatever, actually is to your advantage. It's an old lawyer's trick to, in the process of discovery, to just give them everything. Just to find documents and find excuses 
to give to these authorities. Because once, if you have a box of paperwork that you give to somebody who's an administrator and it's all organized and you have indexes and um, you, know, you have all of these various different things that are arranged in a way like a bureaucrat would relate to another bureaucrat, they're going to flip through it and they're going to say, okay, boom, you're approved. Nine times out of ten. At least this is my experience in the United States, both working as somebody who's applying for something and working as somebody who reviews a lot of these applications. Um, the second thing is create as much documentation as possible. Anytime that you're in the public space, you want to make sure that you have photographers, backup photographers, videographers, backup videographers, and put your call out to as many different lists to have people who are independent filmmakers, people who are on blogs, podcasts, um, amateur photographers, put your call out on Flickr, Picasa, all of these other different sites to encourage people to come and to document what you're doing so that all your message is getting out there and the visuals that you're creating are getting out there in as many different ways as possible. Um, in, when you're going through the permitting process, when you're dealing with authorities, try to get them to agree to certain concrete things, to concrete pathways for protests and marches that are going down streets, concrete time frames, concrete timetables, so that when and if they violate them, you know, for whatever reason, you have some kind of recourse to go back and to rectify the situation. Um, and then the other thing is when you're dealing with choreography, when you're dealing with creating a lot of these different movements, make it as cellular as possible. Jens's point was correct, that unfortunately there are agent provocateurs, some of whom are working for the cops, some of whom just don't like you and might not be working for the cops and might become uh, you know, pseudo agents or whatnot that are, uh, who mean to destroy your movement and to mean, who mean to fight you. Always keep those things in mind when you're organizing distribute a lot of that power as much as you can so that no one person or no any one you know, group of people are too much in charge of any one particular thing because those who would seek to sort of destroy and co-opt and to you know, somehow use and manipulate what you're doing are immediately going to go for those centers of power. Anytime that you can flatten the hierarchy of these things like that, you create a much better environment to prevent that kind of activity from happening. And just other things to look at when you're crafting or trying to craft messages, flash mobs. Um, flash mobs are, for the most part, just straight art pieces. Um, sometimes they have an occasional or a de facto political bent to them. But when you're looking at you know, new ways of organizing demonstrations, look at the tactics that have been implemented um, in flash mobs. That I think that's probably the most exciting vector that we have in terms of demonstrating in terms of activi activism in the public space. Uh, chirping is another sort of concept that's not really as well known. What it is is it's, it's a little bit like programming humans, that you train humans to do a certain number of actions based on a certain number of, um, of verbal cues. Uh, there's a, actually a project in Vienna which I saw called Fight Club, which I think it resembles chirping in a lot of ways. But what basically happens is you have a bunch of people who have a radio um, receiver on their ear. They've been trained you know, in maybe 10 different movements. And then just perhaps like playing an old um, you know, text-based action-adventure game. Chirping is the process of um, forwarding these commands to a big group of people to get them to move in ways um, based on a certain free-arranged set of instructions. Um, that's something that you can Google for, look at as a potential um, uh, direct action through dance sort of thing. Silent dance parties. Sort of like flash mobs, you get a bunch of people to agree to meet at a certain time at a certain place and essentially dance as if it was a party. They might have a prearranged playlist on their iPod or the silent dance parties in Washington, D.C. We meet in DuPont, maybe on a Friday night declared through Facebook, um, and then just go there and for an hour, hour and a half, we just dance to our own music. And the people who are, you know, just happen to be walking through DuPont on a Friday night look at it, maybe think, you know, what's going on here, but then eventually realize that, hey, it's just people dancing and moving in a public space. Um, other things, Chinese SMS protest coordination. I don't necessarily feel that technology, especially communications technologies, are a good way of coordinating people in a public space because they create information that's easily interceptable by law enforcement, by people who, are, um, who have tactics and training to sort of co-opt what you're doing. Any way that you can avoid the use of communications technologies um, to communicate what you're doing, I think, is a good thing, that you should try to avoid them whenever possible. There are, of course, going to be some cases where that's not possible. Um, but, you know, it's also worth looking at. 
critical mass. Um, people who get together and ride their bikes um, in solidarity, take back the roads for bicyclists. Happens in many, many cities you know, around North America, around the world. That's another sort of thing to sort of look at and investigate and see and analyze and break down the tactics for how critical mass works and see if you can bring it to your movement. Um, and then I think we had a couple of other suggestions. Um, Johannes, I think in the back row, did you, you had your hand up. Oh, we, we have a microphone. Okay. Guys, give the, give the org guys a round of applause. They finally found Thank you, Tobix. Okay, cool. Um, I'm planning to do a party in my hometown uh, where people are supposed to bring ghetto blasters. And then uh, we have some iRiver and the DJ, and everybody has the same music. So you can uh, have a large PA with uh, no money. That, that, I think that's, that's a great idea. Johannes? So I was thinking of your question concerning a possible uh, residency in Vienna. And one idea would have would be we could really actually try to organize two or three or four different demonstrations. And actually it doesn't matter what content demonstrations would have. One could be about like surveillance or anti-surveillance and one could be about green stuff, whatever. It's just like not the content is not the, the important thing. Uh, but we could actually invite theater critics to write critiques about the demonstration. So actually to see a demonstration as a f new form of, or actually old form of street theater and uh, have the like, interesting twist here. No, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great idea too. And it's also important to think about what other ways and what alternative forms can you get your message across. Inviting theater critics to a protest. You know, who would ever think to do that? That's always be looking at alternative different forms. That's what people who are more right of center tend to do. They look for different vectors of approaching different things like that. And if you can bring that to your presumably up to center movement, that's great too. Yeah. Another fun thing to incorporate is a pirate, uh, pirate broadcast, bringing a small transmitter, uh, small transmitter with you. Um, and also having a cart. I mean, one, one thing that's really important at a demonstration is to keep the action up, keep everybody really lively, especially if you get kettled. Um, so uh, a really good way of doing that is to bring snacks to give to people, especially caffeine, caffeinated snacks. Bring a nice big pitcher of mata. And yes, the mata is perfect. And uh, yeah, and just g give it to everyone. Make sure everyone's, uh, everyone's hydrated and refreshed. Um, and who knows, maybe you can even get some sponsorship from, uh, from some natural food companies to sponsor some anti-authoritarian demonstration. Definitely. All right, that's all I've got. Thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think I have two or, three qu two or three minutes left for just a couple quick questions. Any? Uh, just straight questions or last minute commentary before uh, I see the stage? Anybody? Okay, cool, great. Thanks again. Yeah. Yeah, that's good.